Bonsoir. Euh, moi, je suis italien et, et Claudia aussi, mais on a choisi de faire cette conversation en anglais. We're going to do this conversation in, in English. I think it's probably the, the easiest and not in Italian. But, um, I couldn't do it in Italian. <laughs> ah, me neither. Um, so good evening, everybody. Welcome for welcome here. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm Stefano Vendramin. I'm a curator in art dedicated to the environment. And this is, um, and I'm programmer of the program Créateur face à l'urgence climatique, or Creators Facing Climate Emergency, which is initiated by the Fondation Tali, which is an art residency and foundation based in Brussels, um, uh, created by the, f the collector and curator and publisher, uh, Nathalie Guillaume. And uh, we're very grateful to L'Ecole des Arts Décoratifs for partnering with this program since October and um, allowing us to be here. In particular, I want to thank um, Patrick uh, de Lojo, La Lafond de Lojo, uh, Francesca Cozzolino for helping with the programming, and of course, uh, the director Emmanuel Tiblou, Jérôme Modic, for um, making this happen. Uh, we're very, very pleased to be here. So since 2000, this program has been running and has been bringing together artists, scientists, uh, designers, uh, thinkers, people such as Tim Ingold, Claudia Conte, Rosalie Biscotti, um, Ernesto Neto, uh, Richard Senna, Tino Segal. Um, we encourage you, uh, we have a podcast and a YouTube channel. We encourage you to, to listen to some of the previous conversations. And um, we bring these people together to uh, help us to, they're all people working on these environmental issues and to help us they can help us imagine new possibilities, new futures, find new solutions for uh, the situation, of course, that we're in. And, of course, uh, the second objective is to uh, accompany the artists, designers, the new generation uh, of today who are thinking about these issues, thinking about how to evolve and integrate uh, these uh, issues into their practice, uh, people like uh, some of you here today. So thank you for being here. Um, tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by Claudia Pesquero, uh, architect, curator, uh, professor of landscape architecture at Innsbruck, uh, prof uh, professor as well of biodigital architecture at UCL, and of course the co-founder of Ecologic Studio, which is a London-based architecture and design innovation firm specialized in biotechnology for the urban environment. And of course as well, Nathalie Blanc, a geographer, artist, director of research at the CNRS, which is France's main uh, scientific institution, and director of the Centre des Politiques de la Terre, uh, the Earth Politics Center, which is a research community working to better understand and manage today's socio-environmental issues through a closer relationship between science and society. And uh, I'll be moderating this conversation with uh, Aurélie Mossé, who's a professor here at the École des Arts Décoratifs, uh, working at the intersection of textile design, architecture, and new technologies, and co-director of the Soft Matters Research Group uh, at Ensad Lab, which is the school's research lab, for those that you don't know, uh, that explores how materials and new technologies, uh, or even old forgotten technologies, can contribute to the design of a more resilient society. So we're going to speak for about an hour, then there'll be some time for your questions, and, uh, and a drink next door. So please hang around for that. And um, with that on that, though, I pass to Aurélie, who will introduce the conversation today. Thank you, uh, Stefano, for the introduction. So I have the hard task to introduce your topic today. Um, in the light of climate imbalance, resource scarcity, and the drastic loss of biodiversity, there is no doubt that we urgently need to rethink our material practice. Uh, with eco-design and sustainable design practices, significant effort have been made to develop creative processes that take more into account their relationship with and on the environment. Yet, they do not necessarily fully participate in the reconfiguring of our whole productive system. So more than design approaches underpinned by the minimization of environmental impacts, what we need to imagine is to imagine and to implement circular, adaptive and regenerative logics taking into account planetary boundaries and the becoming of the biogé, which is to say all the organisms, living and non-living, all the interconnections that support life on Earth. 
So today, from waste as a resource to designing with microbiologic life, from organic to intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, we will ask a few questions. How designers, artists, architects can take the complexity of designing for more uh, resilient futures? How can this complexity be meaningfully negotiated and appropriated at the scale of the building, at the scale of the city? How does living architecture redefine the aesthetic of our everyday life, of our built environment? We're going to dive into this question with our guests and the exciting perspective they, can, they bring with them. Uh, and we're going to start with you, Claudia. I'm uh, just going to introduce you a little bit uh, more in depth. So you're an architect, you're an educator, a researcher, you're working at the intersection of biology, computation and design. Uh, you have co-founded an ecological studio in London. You're also a professor of landscape architecture at Innsbruck's University in Austria, where you founded the Synthetic Landscape Lab and lead the Institute of Urban Design. You're also uh, working in Bartlett, UCL, where you lead the Urban Morphogenesis Lab. Uh, just to say for... Uh, for your positions, but you also have experience as a head curator. You led the Tallinn Biennale, uh, Architectural Biennale in 2017, and you're also the author of um, the co author of Systemic Architecture Operating Manual for the Self Organizing City. And you're about to release the book Deep Green Biodesign in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, uh, which I think you have here with us. Um, and of course, your, your work with Ecological Studio has also been exhibited internationally. We had the chance to see it quite a few times already in, in San Pompidou with La Fabrique du Vivant exhibition and also Réseau Monde uh, last year. Uh, but your work was also exhibited in the Venice Biennale of Architecture at ZKIM in Karlsruhe at COP26 in Glasgow, among others. Um, so what I suggest is we, we have a visual introduction into your work. Uh, so that the crowd uh, can get a sense of it and it will be of the occasion to ask you um, if you could share the vision that is underpinning this work uh, and how you consider the city uh, through these examples. Thanks. Um, thanks for the invite. Um, in a way, as I said, the vision uh, bits of the vision uh, will uh, come out in the book uh, Deep Green uh, that um, is due to be published by uh, June uh, uh, 2023. And um, incidentally, the cover photo is uh, here at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. This is uh, Hortus um, XL and these are Mark and myself, uh, Cyber Gardening. So... Um, how do we go about it? Uh, um, so as we've been said, uh, I'm co-founder of Ecology Studio, and uh, we could say that as a concept, we design the living. Uh, the studio has been founded by Marco Poletto and myself, uh, but uh, include a larger group of researchers and individuals. So we have a studio in London, as well as a lab uh, in the Bartlett UCL and in Innsbruck uh, University. Uh, we develop biodigital design, um, architecture for urban well-being. This is a project from 2017. The Biotech Act is the first photosynthetic architecture we have been developing. Um, and we look at how this possibility of working with microorganisms allow us to um, expand not only what architecture is, but also how we conceive our relationship uh, with the environment. Um, in this case, uh, the example I, I show here are part of the Photosynthetica uh, venture, uh, where we work with microorganisms, in particular microalgae. Microalgae are in itself a consequence of climate change. They bloom uh, in the sea across the planet uh, because they feed on some of the pollutants that our city produce, the urban sphere. Um, but what if we create an alliance with microalgae? So we um, create a relationship with the microorganisms that can feed on elements that are dangerous for us. So what we call pollutants are not pollutants anymore, are simply elements that are present in the water or in the air and that can be dangerous for us, but they are very nutritious for other organisms. 
So uh, recently, um, I will focus on projects that are more related also to museum, exhibition, and, and cultural context. I would say Otravin Air Lab is uh, um, the one more shifted toward the design innovation is the third project that we developed with uh, GSK, Otravin uh, brand. We have worked with them in a series of playgrounds across the planet, one of which was also presented at COP. Uh, 26 and this playground integrate microalgae and through their morphology the interaction with the kids are able to uh, reduce the pollutant in the air between 75 and 95 percent we measure that through sensor we interact with the kids in the in the um, in the remetabolization of the air in the creation of new microclimate but through this project uh, we then look at how when you work with nature-based solution, uh, the question is also, how do you close the loop? Differently from a mechanical filter, the microalgae don't remove element from the air and then you still have the pollutant somewhere. The algae eat it, they remetabolize it, then create biomass. So the Air Lab um, is a project, has been a project as well as a live workshop. Uh, our studio worked from there for three days a week for six months between uh, June and December and is now moving to Geneva to the headquarter of um, GSK there. Uh, we have been working in cultivating the microalgae, remetabolizing the air, but also uh, working with scientists in producing biopolymer that are completely biodegradable for the biomass produced by the algae while they grow and feed on the pollutant we pr were producing in central London. And out of this uh, biomass, we started to investigate which type of product, material, architectural um, object can uh, be developed in the in the lab. We develop this is the the neti pot is a, a nasal nasal wash, so contribute to your health, um, and it was uh, um, printed during the life uh, of the lab. Uh, we then had the occasion to testing a scaling up of the project uh, through a collaboration with uh, Hyundai in uh, Korea. Uh, we have been working with them uh, in the last uh, years. So the first project was developed for Hyundai Motor Studio Busan, um, where we presented few projects, but in particular at the entrance uh, Tree One is part of the Habitat One exhibition. They investigate uh, what are the human of the future. So um, Tree One is a form of synthetic tree connected to the concept uh, of the tree has been um, designed through algorithms that are fitted with information related to trees as well as uh, ancient Greek column. has been uh, 3D printed with some of the robots uh, that are traditionally used uh, in the machine industry. And um, in a way it becomes a form of carbon storage. Is in itself a sculpture or a, or a, or a or a column and a carbon storage and integrate as well a live microalbeg in the photoreactor that you see uh, here. The exhibition includes other elements like Cortus that you see in the background, the photosynthetic tower and the photosynthetic wall. So in the whole exhibition, you again remetabolize the air, harvest the algae and 3D print in this case in a, a larger scale. Um, but the, the um, how do we evolve and how do we create a relationship with these uh, microalgae? This was uh, investigated also in the Bit Biobot, presented at the last architectural uh, biennale. The question of the curator in that case was how do we live together? And our question became how do we live uh, with other form of non-human organism and microalgae? Uh, bit by your bot, uh, envision a uh, home environment composed of three elements. The curtain, the curtain are uh, somehow the filter between the outdoor environment and the indoor and the, are the area where the algae are inoculated and grow and transform the air that enter um, the, living, the living quarter. Uh, the garden, the garden is the area of cultivation with daily cultivation and uh, practice as well as uh, harvesting. I have some of the phot photobioreactor at home. I harvest uh, regularly, apart from biopolymer. Of course, the spirulina and the chlorella are uh, food source, and uh, um, they can be used uh, daily at, um, as cool in the culinary environment. The third component is the convivium. Uh, for us, uh, it's important how we address ecology 
also through pleasure. That can be uh, visual pleasure or taste. Um, so pleasure is a way for us to understand the environment that surround us. So um, the, the third element, uh, Integrate, is a set of um, uh, glass 3D printed, uh, uh, 3D printed glass glasses <laughs> um, that we developed with Varoski in this case with um, upcycled uh, glass that was uh, 3D printed following um, algorithm that map uh, the algae cell morphology. Each of them contain uh, microalgae and biogel. This is an uh, edible biogel, so each of them uh, is uh, effectively a food or a drink, depends how you see it, it's uh, sort of jelly. And um, um, as a, the same proteic intake of a T-bone steak or a Fiorentina, we could say. Depends, I don't know, it's called in French, but yeah. <laughs> Do you have it? A <laughs> gros steak, uh, a steak, uh, what, like a big steak. How do you I say big steak in, I was in French? I wondering what is uh, Côte de Boeuf. Yeah. Okay, that one. <laughs> I don't eat meat, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I eat spirulina. So this is my home, effectively. So um, uh, the question is, how do you change the daily practice? Of course, uh, algae farming exists. We didn't invent them. We work with multiple color microalgae. We started to understand how we can um, establish a relationship with different form of microorganism. But algae farm exists, and exists also lab that synthesize the algae. So our work is really in embedding them not only in cultural context but also into project, as I said, uh, uh, permanent building, uh, um, headquarter of different uh, um, innovation company, um, as well as uh, playground or the home environment. How do we change our relationship with the environment? How do we involve a larger group of uh, um, individuals in uh, taking care of the planet. So the ecology is not anymore a top-down system, but becomes more of a bottom-up practice that uh, uh, each individual could practice, cultivate, or cyber garden, as well as uh, contribute to. This idea of collective intelligence is what inspired the, the last project that I'm um, briefly commenting on, which is the Gamfisarium, La Derive Nouverique, that was uh, presented, I think, uh, more or less exactly one year ago at the Centre Pompidou, and now is part of the Centre Pompidou collection. Um, another element, oh, the font changed continue, completely. <laughs> An element that, <laughs> I will never use that font, just to let you know. <laughs> But it's okay. <laughs> Maybe it's okay. it's cool. Uh, so for a design audience, you've just <laughs> lost lost half the audience. <laughs> so the um, one one other element that uh, influenced this uh, project that uh, was supposed to start before the pandemic and then happen after the pandemic was a set of exploratory trip that uh, we did also with our family. So at a certain point, we were stuck in London for one year, and we had to go and visit family in Turin. We didn't want to fly. There were too many constraints. And so we decided to cycle. Uh, so we decided to cycle. We went through cycle route. And here I have, I'm not going to go in detail on that, because I don't have a proper lecture. But we are planning a next book when we integrate more of this landscape exploration. Um, in it. And um, so the first week we went uh, through all through cycling route from uh, directly out of East London, where our studio and as well our, our home is, and um, in the middle of the gravel road of the English uh, countryside. They have a sense of romantic, is probably a little bit different from the uh, French one. And then we cross the channel. And um, on the French side, we was everything very pristine. And, uh, and then we was, was very pristine, the cycle route. It was incredible, the morphological difference of the cycle route from the, uh, the, um, the, the English side and the French side. It was uh, one uh, very sort of uh, wild, the other very organized, but incredibly completely disconnected from the car network. It's something that I didn't know before the trip. There is a complete network of cycling path through which you effectively we cross 
all France, because Turin stays just on the other side of the border and uh, London just on this side. They cross the old France without meeting any car or other type of, uh, of uh, well, just a little bit of car when we arrived in Paris. <laughs> and that uh, is um, something that allows us uh, to experience a different material understanding of the landscape. And that's something that is really important for us. So when we were asked to uh, reflect uh, on the future of Paris, we um, decided to collaborate with Fisarium Polycephalum, the lime mold that you see here. Uh, le, le blob en français. <laughs> le blob, it's a book. <laughs> I don't think it's called le blob. It's called Mas de Vanet, a different scientific name. Ah. It's not a scientific name, but it's a common name we use here. I think maybe the scientific name is still Fisaro Polycephalum in Latin for all. Uh, so um, it's called Fisarium Polycephalum. Polycephalum means multi-headed because the slime, although it's an unicellular organism, has got multiple heads. It's got uh, millions of nuclei that occupy this cell. And the way the slime mold uh, uh, find food and uh, optimize the distribution res of resources is not uh, through uh, a top-down reading of the environment that surround it, <laughs> but uh, um, through the relationship of the nuclei between themselves and the environment. And this is something that with projects like the Biobombola or the playground or multiple playground we want to trigger. The capability of the single unit to work with ecology and eventually uh, trigger a collective intelligence. So when we had to um, reflect on the future of Paris, we, we ran um, a simulation. So we uh, map all the wet and photosynthetic area of Paris uh, on a um, relatively large simulation in thermal slime mold because usually it's microscopic. In this case, it was one meter and a half by 50 centimeter simulation um, across uh, Paris where we use a grid to, to distribute uh, a tractor that in this case were the green area. You, here you see uh, the drawing and the simulation on the side. We ran the simulation for approximately uh, three weeks. Uh, time. So essentially, this is, a, this is a map of Paris, but as seen by the, the slime mold, right? Yes, all the dots uh, are, are, are uh, discretizing Paris in green point, and then the slime mold is recomputing uh, the network that connects the, the green infrastructure and the, and the wet infrastructure. So we, we work on this, on this uh, simulation, and then we fed this simulation to an um, AI algorithm that would uh, transform the image of future Paris from the Osmanian Paris to a more fragmented, uh, almost a uh, new medieval Paris where the neighborhood are interconnected, remetabolized, and the green pocket much more connected in, be in between the cells rather than follow your axis. We did this through scale. This is the one to 1,000. And then we go down uh, towards the center of Pompidou. And this is, um, in reality, was a video, but here we have the frame. Uh, this is the last uh, frame is one of my favorite ones where the slime mold is uh, rethinking um, the center Pompidou, which incidentally is also one of my favorite building where infrastructure is part of the aesthetic of the building. And for me, infrastructure is a key aspect that uh, need to involve uh, design. And in this case, uh, the, the, the slime mold of Fisarium Polycephal rethink it as a form of uh, organic, uh, wet, uh, a uh, set of uh, pipes, uh, the pipes of the Pompidou are completely remorphologized, uh, you might recognize them uh, from uh, the, the color. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Natalie. I just wanted to quickly ask, uh, verify one thing. C like, so, of course, you're working with these microorganisms, you're seeing how you can collaborate with them. How would you sum up very briefly, it's not just about um, using these microalgae or these um, slime in your work, there's a kind of a bigger vision you have, right, for how we can rethink the cities. Could you like very briefly just sum up how you, how you interpret this? What, what, how do you see the future of tomorrow? Like what's the big difference from today from tomorrow?
Well, uh, for me, uh, what is uh, really relevant is not to use this organism, but to establish relationship and uh, to be able uh, to move uh, from the city that we inherited from modernity, which is uh, still influenced by Zoni, where the living quarter is uh, separated from waste uh, processing or from production, um, a city where uh, these uh, uh, cycles are more interconnected, so that we don't have um, the segregation between the living quarter and the productive quarter, but we have a more interconnected system. Of course, um, the modernism had segregated uh, this uh, environment uh, uh, because of the byproduct. But uh, at the moment, with nature-based technology, we have uh, less uh, hazardous product, uh, problem, but also... With the byproduct being the, the, what we call waste, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you imagine the first industrial revolution, the, some of the byproducts were quite uh, intense. So it's understandable, the segregation. But if you work with a uh, um, nature-based uh, solution, the, uh, the possibility is to integrate. And so to embrace uh, what I think I see in some of your questions, also the aspect of dark ecology, see waste as a resource. This uh, uh, requires uh, simulation on multiple scale, and we require a bit of time if we don't want to dispose completely the infrastructure that we have nowadays. But uh, for me, if we want to work ecologically, it's essential uh, to make a shift um, in which not only we change resources, we use more renewable resources, but we change also the way we work with resources, with the whole cycle, with integration of uh, production in our daily life and in the city. Thank you. Um, Nathalie Blanc, thank you for being here as well. So just to introduce you a little bit more. So um, as we mentioned, you're a geographer, uh, director of research at CNRS, director of the Centre des Politiques de la Terre, which is a collaboration between the Université Paris-Cité and Sciences Po. And uh, as a scientist, you coordinated numerous uh, research programs over, over the year, um, um, over, the, over, decades. over the decades, yeah. <laughs> over time, especially uh, around the, the place of nature in the city and on environmental aesthetics, um, which is why we thought it would be very, very interesting to have you here. And some of these include, for instance, as a French delegate in the research network COST, which some of you scientists out there might know, which is the European Cooperation on Science and Technology, including most recently programs such as supporting adaptation to climate change through citizen capacity building, and uh, another one on the intersection between social environmental inequalities and collective mobilization in Greater Paris. And you're also a pioneer of eco-criticism, uh, which is the intersection of, of literature and ecology, and have published several books um, we could go on but uh, about many books, but uh, Les Animaux et la Ville, so Animals in the City, uh, Vers une esthétique environnementale, so Towards an Environmental Aesthetic, and most recently last year, uh, Art, Farming and Food for the Future. Um, so what, unusually for a scientist, you started your career as, well, you, you studied fine arts <laughs> before becoming um, before work, becoming a geographer, and uh, you still have an artistic practice. Um, but also you have coordinated many art and science projects, um, particularly with Coral, uh, Le Laboratoire de la Culture d'Orab, so the Sustainable Culture Lab. And uh, so hopefully we hear some about more about this interesting intersection later. And um, I wanted to ask you in particular, because um, of all these decades of research that you've spent um, looking at the place of nature in the city, and uh, I see, you know, in Paris, I, I, I come from London, but I've seen that there's so many programs, initiatives about greening Paris, and I know many other cities are doing the same thing. And I wanted to know um, what uh, what do you what do you think of these programs like, in terms of their how interesting do you think they really are? You know, it, it, do we is it all we need to do is is gre put a you know. Um, Honey, honey on our rooftops and, and green roofs on our bus stations, uh, or do we need to do more? And and what I what I like very much about Claudia's work with Electric Studio is it feels like it's going much further than this kind of greening activity that we see. So I wanted to know, with given you know the history of these things, or what did you think 
of these initiatives that we see today in terms of how they've evolved and do you think we need to go closer to what um, Claudia is, is presenting? Well, thank you for the invitation, first of all, and uh, I'm very uh, grateful to participate to this conversation. Let me go back a bit uh, in terms of decades. When I started in the 80s, uh, uh, really I was in fine arts, that's true, and I was very critical of the fine arts of the time. I was working on waste issues. I was like collecting small spoon, plastic spoons in the streets and just making piles of them. And, uh, but m most of my colleagues uh, at the fine arts of, uh, at the School of Fine Arts in Paris were not very politically engaged. That's very important to understand how I became a scientist. So at the time, I decided that I needed to be more engaged. If you go back in the 80s, nobody was working, or not so many people were working on the environmental issues. And so I decided that the environment was going to be the next universal political fight that we had to engage with. So that's how I decided to become a scientist. Working with waste at the time, I decided that I needed to work on the issue of living beings in cities being treated as waste. Uh, meaning uh, I did my PhD on cockroaches. Uh, if any of you know about cockroaches, they, they are small insects, tropical insects, that are living in cities because they find many resources for them. They're not waste per se, they're not dirty per se, they're just animals which take, uh, which take care of min much of the waste of the city in fact, like rats for example, or other animal living, uh, living beings in the city. And so I did this book, Animals in the City, uh, which was published at the time at Odile Jacob, uh, and I try to define the different way of looking at living beings in the city. On one side, you had like these disgusting animals, uh, meaning rats, pigeons, and cockroaches. And on the other side, you had nature, which was very much desired, like parks, greens, and everything that was set up to, de to, to, to fabric the city since at least the 19th century. So, I mean, if you go back, you can go back in time and see how places were uh, built up and from the 16th century on, but it was very much in the 19th century that the green uh, participated to the fabric of a modern city, but also a hygienic one. I mean, it's very important to understand how the modern city was built up in order to just evacuate or filter everything that was dirty. You know, you had to have the perfect environment and just forget about the rest. So working on the cockroach was very much a critique of how much the modern city was built just to forget about undesired nature. And that's still the case today, I think. I mean, for example, uh, I have this European project I'm working on. It's like the regreening of schoolyards, mostly to profit uh, uh, kids and teachers. And everybody forgot about the fact that if you put greens, you have insects. Uh, that come with it. I mean, they just forgot that the living things are a system. And uh, if you create some micro ecosystems in schoolyards, you also have undesired uh, animals. And so I'm always working on tackling things which pinpoint a critical aspect of our fabric of the modern environment. I mean, that's why how I see, I mean, we have uh, uh, a different vision, I mean, in terms of fabric of the city, because my vision is always a scientific critique, I would say. And uh, so being at the head of the Center for Earth Politics, 
I try to make people collaborate around this critical issue of the fabric of modern environments and try to see what it disregards. I mean, poor people, cockroaches, rats, and whatever you can uh, think of. Uh, so that's a d very different view, I guess. Uh, it doesn't mean that one does invalidate the other. It means that it sets the vision very differently in terms of uh, critique. And I must say that during the COVID, I was very much surprised to see that an important mayor of a, surround, of a city surrounding Paris, a very rich city surrounding Paris, said that we could uh, just evacuate all nature in city because doing so we wouldn't have any more sickness or any more epi uh, epidemic. Uh, and they just forgot that uh, like cockroaches and other animals, uh, we live with all kinds of living beings inside us, outside ourselves, and we can't fo just forget them because they won't let uh, themselves be forgotten. And the same for, for example, ants. Um, we have done this exhibition in uh, Lausanne uh, about undesired uh, animals, like pests in the city. And right now we have an invasion of ants, very small ants. They feed on the deaf, on the dead, because they're very much present in the cemetery. And, uh, you know, and trying to, 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 I mean, they're not, in cities, especially to bother us, but in fact, they set up all kinds of relationships which are not very much uh, desired. So I think that we have to think, just to sum up what I uh, had in mind, is to say, for one nature we desire, there is one nature we don't desire and we try to disregard. And it's always the case, even in ourselves, so that's something we have to think about, I guess. Uh, is that uh, an answer to your question? Yeah, no, it's a, and it's a very important uh, analysis to be made. I, I wondered yeah, if you the, wanted to reply, is, uh, Claudia. Well, I have more of a personal comment, and there is definitely a cultural shift that is required where you engage with uh, uh, biological system. Two things came to my mind. One is very personal on the cockroaches. <laughs> I actually have cockroaches at home, uh, but not in the house, in a terrarium, because uh, they were brought by my son, Giacomo. He, during the pandemic again, he adopted the tarantula we had in the lab, because the lab was abandoned and the tarantula as well. So he adopted the tarantula and then um, one day he arrived home with a lot of cockroaches and I'm like, <laughs> even myself, <laughs> of, uh, really? Yes, mommy, that's really ecological because they are in a cycle. They are very healthy for the tarantula as a food and you can feed them with a lot of waste. Okay, then. <laughs> that's fine. And, um, but that is something that often uh, we, and even myself had a, had a strange reaction to cockroaches, but then it's, it's uh, the cultural shift is something that uh, you, you, encounter all the time in project. I had an occasion, this is almost a gossip, in which a large facade with microalgae, um, a CEO was coming to visit, a very important person, let's say, and um, some of the people that were taking care of the building, they decided to tidy up the photobioreactor with, of course, antibacterial <laughs> product. <laughs> and I arrived and was full of foam. And some people were saying, what happened to the algae? They are unwell. And I go near and they say, but this is no algae foam. The algae foam is round. I'm obsessed with morphology because I'm an architect. <laughs> so <laughs> algae foam is round. This is hexagonal shape. This is cleaning product foam. It's something else. Yes, we clean them. <laughs> How do you clean algae? <laughs> you cultivate them. It's it's really. I mean, this is a very funny accident, but uh, uh, and quite extreme. I have to say. Usually, this doesn't happen. It's a, it's a, it's an accident. But uh, it's uh, somehow depicting the fact that um, 
some of the conversation that we have. There is always a question of cleaning and maintenance all the time. We say we don't do any maintenance, we cultivate. There is no maintenance. It's actually also a pleasurable activity. You can do it in group and, uh, and there are always some hard part of life. But the, this, um, this aspect of um, taking in consideration the overall ecology for its own opportunity, but also for its uh, negative aspect and understand how to co-live uh, with this aspect is, is really something that uh, requires uh, um, a conversation that we are not used to at the moment. Yeah, I, I could go on, go on on this issue of making na uh, of putting nature at work. I mean, it's something that we have uh, uh, at play uh, from the 19th century on. I mean, for the workers coming from the countryside to the city as workers in big industrial uh, uh, settings. And so the greens at the time were supposed, gardens and stuff, were supposed to put the workers uh, far from... Keep, keep, the, keep them from alcohol, being alcoholic or such. And nowadays, if you go uh, to the way we make nature work in cities, for example, if you try to look at what we did in schoolyards, at the first, they just calculated how much cooling would be these greens in schoolyards. I mean, and the issue for the greens was not uh, greens as such, or biodiversity as such, or ecological system as such. It was just a way to cool uh, the, the, the schools. So that, once again, I think that uh, the view that we have of nature in cities is very much an uh, instrumental uh, view of what we can fabric. And once again, I think that the, we haven't moved, uh, we haven't shifted so much from this view fr uh, born in the at least the 19th century. So I, I can be critical of that because it brings a whole uh, view of this ecological system, which, are, which is very far from what we can see when we look at interaction between social system and ecological system on real, uh, doing real field work and not just looking at laboratories. And uh, so that's something important in terms of research, I guess. I wanted to go on a little bit further with the question of uh, the design process. What, does, what kind of difference does it make to work with the living? I mean, we know that architecture had a tendency to think itself as something permanent, to think materials as, as things that are inert. Uh, what kind of differences does it bring into the design process to actually uh, conceive and interact and fabricate the world with the living? And how much digital technology are part of this equation for you, Claudia? Uh, some of the aspects that were just debated now. Um, one uh, observation that I often uh, make is that uh, when uh, the world architecture came about, we were in the uh, Renaissance in Florence. So that's the first time uh, um, from uh, craftsmanship that was a more uh, rena relational model of construction. Uh, we move uh, to a geometrical drawing that uh, precisely uh, guide the construction and also conceptual drawing using the perspective view. At the time, what, uh, what uh, we often discuss uh, in, with our team, uh, the concept of the urban sphere and the relationship between the urban sphere and the biosphere was totally different. So um, uh, somehow wilderness was wilder. Um, and um, so maybe um, architecture is an interface between the human and the non-human on the human and the milieu in which he is embedded, or she, or it. <laughs> um, he, it was more of a, a fortress. And the design tool, uh, the prospective view. Uh, but nowadays, we can't uh, almost uh, feel uh, the biosphere uh, in our city. 
the urban sphere is uh, much stronger and with the urban sphere is not only the, the, the city itself, but this whole network of information, matter, and energy that feed the city, all the mining system, all the network of data uh, that, uh, that feed our city is very strong. So maybe architecture is a um, sort of uh, special system that uh, articulate our relationship uh, with the other being human, non-human and with environment should move uh, from being a static object framed uh, by the prospective view to a more uh, soft, uh, wet, subtle interface that allow us uh, to create a dialogue with the, with the environment, uh, with planet Earth, with other organisms. And um, Another thing that I say often is that uh, we are in time of climate change, but the planet change continuously. So you can't stop change, really. But uh, maybe, rather than being a disrupted change, uh, architecture, design, spatial organization can allow us to read pattern, to create a different uh, dialogue uh, with the planet, uh, and establish more positive and less disruptive uh, dynamic of change, still being inside of change. In that sense, uh, um, biological simulation or computational system um, can enable us uh, to maybe observe this dynamic. So yes, also the, the technique uh, uh, that uh, architecture deployed are changing, becomes design, becomes more a matter of conversation also with uh, non-human organisms, artificial intelligence, biological intelligence, rather than a question of uh, uh, designing a specific morphology. It's moving from uh, dealing with morphologies to dealing with morphogenesis. So if you even check the Wikipedia definition, morphology is a catalog of static uh, shape. And I love morphology, but it's a catalog of static shape where morphogenesis is the process of becoming of force, of, of shape under forces of matter, information, and energy. So uh, in that sense, uh, for me, uh, Contemporary architecture should deal more with morphogenesis and less with morphology. And maybe a side question to that. Um, how do you consider your relationship with the microalgae? Um, how does it change um, your position or your role as an architect to actually have interference very on a very concrete basis with the living? Well, I, I think it also changed uh, slightly. Um, I don't like boundary, you might have realized. <laughs> so um, I think also uh, the definition uh, um, architect, uh, biologist, computational designer um, are uh, somehow sometimes the disciplinary boundary are, uh, in my opinion, uh, too static. Um, often I got uh, I receive another question. How can you, as an architect, uh, deal uh, with uh, uh, scientific uh, concept? Okay. I, uh, the pragmatic answer is that I did engineering as well. But <laughs> the non-pragmatic answer is that uh, I consider myself an individual and a professional. And so somehow I would prefer to be defined myself also algorithmically. Integrating, uh, like if you take an algorithm, I have uh, X percentage of this uh, plus uh, a percentage of Y and Z, and these uh, X, Y, and Z are uh, biology, computation, and design. Maybe architecture has got the larger percentage, but there is a knowledge that uh, we hold in the team of biology and the research that we do on biology that is specific of our group. And uh, I think it's more and more important to define profession in a specific manner that is transdisciplinary. So, um, because some of the experimentation we do with microalgae are larger than the one that biology run in the lab. They are smaller and more, uh, let's say, looking at a wider range of microalgae, um, exploring also the interaction, the more the interaction with the user than what algae farmers do. So they are very specific of our realm and the protocol with which we cultivate algae is specific of that. In that sense, I think uh, um, it's important uh, to define a profession in an, more, in an expanded manner in which we hold effectively knowledge that is also traditionally part of other disciplinary domain. And maybe it's interesting to stay on this idea of interdisciplinary professions then and, and maybe get your opinion then. 
Natalie, on how, so obviously you studied uh, arts and then you became a geographer and you still work between the two. And how do you, how do you define yourself? How do you see that communication happening? What's the value that, do you, that they that each gets from each other? Do you are they parallel? Are they um, very intersected? Uh, what do you think about? Once again, when I started in the eighties, I was an heir from the. You know, all the 70s and this time when people and artists decided that attitude could become form. And so that's how I could shift from uh, just collecting spoons in the street. And I was in the uh, workshop of Poltonsky at the time and uh, at uh, the Beaux-Arts de Paris and shift to just study cockroaches and decide that this was an aesthetic gesture. Uh, and it was perceived as such, uh, even as a PhD. I mean, and I was very, very surprised to be so well received at the CNRS because that was a surprise. And if I wouldn't have been an artist at the time, I wouldn't have decided to study cockroaches because uh, uh, nobody would have done that with a, the, a sane mind. I mean, that was not the trend. I mean, uh, obviously. So this first move was decidedly a very a creative one. Uh, and that's how uh, this, uh, I did the first PhD on nature and city in the 90s. It's because I was first an artist. And that's something we can discuss, how being an artist can bring new topics to research and back and forth, and trying to decide that the creative mind is also someone who authorized himself, herself, to just uh, open new ways of seeing cities and not just, you know, the, the, the people used to work on green spaces, for example, as bases contributing to quality of life. I mean, cockroaches wouldn't contribute to quality of life, but if you study the role of cockroaches and different animals in cities, they're very important to define how we live the city even. For example, I worked also on cats and the dynamic of population of cats in cities with genetician. And very, the, the cats do change, the free cats, the ones who are in the streets, do change of genetics when, once they are in cities. And they very much interact with uh, a series of people, uh, usually women uh, of lower class, and who do feed them and find uh, this uh, feeding as a way to contributing to the quality of life, of contributing also to a living city uh, as such. So this means that there are series of animals and living beings in cities, even human beings who are doing illegal things because it's uh, you're supposed to receive a fine when you do feed people, pigeons or different kind of animals, but who do contribute to that. And all this study of animals and even afterwards of plants, because I did study plants, but free plants, you know, white plants in cities, how do they spread out through different parks and how do gardeners in parks in Paris do contribute to uh, take them out and save them from a certain death because w at the time you were supposed to throw them away after a season uh, because they were not fresh anymore or not colored or not flowery and take them and put them in another park in order to save them showing that they had you know a sense of the importance of what's living and how rare and precious it is to be living. And that's something that's very partaking among different people in the population. So that's something to value as such. And all these studies were done in collaboration with different scientists, geneticians, physicists. I worked also on air pollution or biologists, ecologists and also with artists, because at the time, in 2006, I decided that the environmental issues were not uh, taken as an aesthetic issue. Uh, 
And what I understood with the cockroach and other animals and with the issue of non-desired animals, that how we filter living beings in cities is how much we find certain animals and certain plants disgusting or not aesthetic. For example, if you think of a cockroach, of how many insects you find them ugly or something which is related to your disgust of them, and how this has to change somehow in terms of uh, uh, ecology. And this aesthetic issue do count in how we treat uh, and how we make the city. It's very important and it can be shown through your work how much uh, nice and, and beautiful it is, you know, and how important it is in the way people do receive uh, this work and how certain species do not receive the same welcome uh, in, uh, in, uh, in cities, especially in very well-tended cities like Paris. So uh, in 2006, I decided to work with artists more and to renew with my artistic practice. And that's how I met Cole. Cole is an NGO doing the, the Cole Prize, which is a prize for art and environment. And so we did, uh, and it has been running on since 2006 at least. And we have created with Cole uh, the Laboratory for Sust Sustainable Culture. And we have also done different residencies, uh, mingling artists and uh, creators and scientists and trying to tackle different issues, both of us, meaning like different teams. Uh, for example, we had this uh, residency at the Domaine de Chamarande, which is in the south of Paris, it's a castle. Uh, and uh, this residency lasted one year and there were teams and uh, each team was composed of a scientist and of uh, an artist and this residency was called Soil Fictions and we tackled the issue of living soils which is something which is very important even today because we study how many uh, small animals, insects and such, are in the soil and how important they are in terms of making the soil uh, 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 fruitful uh, substrate. And uh, so that was also a uh, uh, pluridisciplinary perspective. And we did many residencies like that in between artists and, uh, and uh, scientists. And the other part of my practice is more dedicated to writing. And that's very important because I think that we need to find new way to represent the issue of the Anthropocene. Uh, at the Center for Earth Politics, we just try to, 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 to fund some research which try to find new ways to represent through drawings, through tales, through fictions, through different ways of representing these uh, issues. For example, the Earth, we see it as a balloon. Uh, are there no other ways to see it? And new images, new tales, new fiction. Also the place of women uh, regarding the environmental issues. We have had a round table regarding eco-feminism and the way women do uh, have an important role uh, regarding the taking care of nature. One thing I didn't say uh, regarding free cats, it's uh, mostly women are taking care of these small animals and even them say that big animals are for men, like elephants, and smaller are for women. So, you know, it's like very well integrated. So we need to men, men to pick up the cockroach uh, cockroaches as a division of labor. Um, I had one last question quickly before maybe we get some, yeah. a few questions from the audience. I don't, Aurélie, did you have a, I had one question, I'm a very practical person and, and I wanted to, we talked a lot now just about the how as the aesthetics of um, the living world around us is, is, a, is a barrier um, and, and so is, how would you, what, what is, what is, I mean, Claudia, for instance, with your work, you work 
first with prototypes, but then you actually have now been in office buildings and you made a, a playground. Um, how, what is the, um, the barrier do you see for your vision of things to, of, uh, to, get, to, get, to get that really, for, to be uh, one that we integrate in how we create schools, how we, you know, on a, on a bigger scale? And, and maybe Natalie, you have a comment on that as well. Well, you, you mentioned aesthetic at some point and then you diverted somewhere else. So I'll pick up on aesthetic um, because actually I think that's uh, one of the obstacles. Of course, there are all the infrastructural obstacles, but uh, one of the uh, obstacles, in my opinion, uh, is that, or, or I have the suspect that we come from 200 years that are a little bit uh, um, uh, driven uh, by... Um, let's say, uh, rational reading of reality. And I have nothing against that. But uh, for example, if you take the slime mold, you can read it through uh, drawing, through poetry, through computation. And for me, no one of the reading is more true than the other. It's always a reading. The slime mold in itself is ontologically the slime mold. You just can read it, right? So, unfortunately, uh, I have the impression that uh, um, there is a layer of society where political decision and societal societal decision are taken, where um, the um, the one that Gregory Bateson would uh, define meta language is not valued as much as the language. So the, the name of Ecology Studio actually come from the book of Gregory Bateson, Steps on Ecology of Mind, where he defines ecology as a set of interconnected systems that as human, he was an anthropologist, cybernetician. He was probably didn't like boundary as well. <laughs> so um, he, he, in which uh, he defined uh, meta language as this set of languages that are not uh, um, the traditional logical and verbal languages. So it's uh, visual languages, uh, sound, uh, uh, love, emotion, all these other languages as uh, human, we are. Um, able to express uh, and that allow us also to establish communication with the non-human environment. For example, he had an octopus at home uh, with which he was um, uh, making observation and establishing cybernetic communication. So for me, uh, the obstacle is uh, the value uh, that uh, we currently give to non-verbal language. How seriously do we take non verbal language in establishing an ecological planet. So for me to establish an ecological planet and really integrate the system, uh, we need to uh, trust uh, meta-language discourse as much as language one. And um, that it reflect uh, on, on, on many aspects. And of course, then there might be practical uh, concern, but that uh, for me is, uh, is, the main, uh, is the main one. Did you want to re respond, Natalie, or? No, I think that's okay. good. Do we have any questions from the audience? I can translate-ish, or well, I can translate if it's in French as well. Anybody? Nobody? I think there is a hand. A grey hand. hand. Yeah? So halfway up. Halfway up. up. Yeah, that's it. Good enough. Yeah, that's good enough. Hi. Um, that was really interesting. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to ask, um, because the hashtag above you is talking about a climate emergency and obviously we are within a kind of climate and ecological uh, sort of decline disaster. Um, I wondered if you could talk about um, sort of resistance to this thinking and or um, the fact that though these kind of human to animal or human to bacteria or human to slime relationships are fascinating, the fundamental problems that we are facing beyond you know, any kind of epochal, epochal change comes down to human-to-human -human relationships and human-to-human problems. 
Um, and, I, and I really, that's how I see this. Um, and I do a lot of work in activism and find there's a great deal of resistance to, uh, to um, kind of thinking in other ways. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the resistance you face and how you overcome that or don't. Well, I mean, I, I was, uh, there was recently a report, a great report, which was asked by Macron about how we should, we should teach more ecology in all schools and all levels of uh, teachings. And uh, I was very surprised because uh, we just tried to set up the common course, which will be nationally uh, uh, diffusé. Uh, and I was the pilot of the third theme, which was very much on models of action. And I share your sense of emergency. At the Center for Earth Politics, we talked about habitability of the, within the planetary boundaries. So we're not just discussing about this relationship between living beings and, uh, and uh, human beings, but also uh, of the fact that many uh, environments will not be livable in the years, in the next years to come. I mean, so there is a real sense of emergency. And I was quite surprised to see that all my colleagues, uh, when I uh, said that we should talk about inequalities as being at the center of what drives uh, the dynamics of, uh, of degradation of the environment, were agreeing with me. So I think this sense of emergency and the roots of them are more and more tackled with uh, and more uh, understood widely than uh, before. But still, I think that may not be enough <laughs> regarding the real emergency. I mean, I understand there is a, a, a growing awareness of what's going on, but I guess, will that be enough? I, we're not sure right now. I mean, I think we're sure that not. <laughs> Are there any other burning questions? Otherwise, probably a good time to draw to a close. Um, did you have any last words that you wanted to share, Rolly? No, I think we had a, a question, a last question to throw to the audience, uh, which was, um, do you have a, a sort of recommendation of reading or an action you want to suggest for young designers and artists, um, some recommendations? Well, the reading, uh, I have <laughs> <laughs> Some reading. <laughs> No, the reading, uh, there is uh, our book coming Deep out, green. Deep Green, yeah. We also have uh, some texts uh, in our um, website, there are the project, but there is also the knowledge room, uh, where uh, there are articles about us, but you can also select uh, the paper, so more in-depth uh, information about uh, uh, the project. Uh, in action, perhaps, to, to start adopting cockroaches. <laughs> There's many out there. They need your help. No, I don't think they need our help. <laughs> Maybe you need their help. <laughs> my, my son feeds them with uh, leftover from oranges, I think. So yeah, if you like oranges, maybe there is a synergy with cockroaches or you maybe you know better. Well, I would recommend to create or to elaborate creative assemblies such as this one but more open in order to be able to discuss widely of how do we see the future uh, I I'm going to th there is a learning planet festival at the end of January and we have this round table and I suggested a drawing from Kim Stanley Robinson book about the ministry of the future that we try to tackle collectively this issue, how do we think that uh, a ministry of the future could be designed, institutional design, what should it do, should we, should it do, and how could we uh, participate in such a ministry, and try to see how we project ourselves uh, in the future and see the present from the future and try to see what we need in terms of knowledge but also in terms of skills, competencies and try to uh, set them in our schools, all our schools and universities. So that's my... 
Well, thank you very much, both of you, for being here. A round of applause for our two speakers. Thank you. <laughs> if you had any questions and you were too shy, uh, we're going to have a drink next door. So uh, that's a chance to, to ask some more questions to our speakers. Will you be able to stay a bit, little bit longer? A little bit longer. So if you want to get Nathalie Blanc, you have to run. Um, you can watch this conversation again or share it. And there'll be a podcast as well being released in the next few days. So uh, look out for that. Um, and the next conversation will be uh, in French. Uh, will be with Suzanne Husky and Geneviève Prouveau around uh, ecofeminism. And that will be the 15th of February here. And, the and after that, we will have on the 15th of March, Patrick Bouchin, the architect, and uh, Frédéric Aitwaiti, um, who is both a theater maker and a historian of science. Um, so, hope you can come to that and uh, bonsoir. <laughs>